Okay, we should have a significant improvement on the audio quality here, and for that, I'd like to thank Jim of Atheist Edge for helping me figure out what kind of setup I needed for a microphone and a power supply, and I'd like to thank Cirrus for helping me learn how to use the filters in Audacity. My formal education ends with a high school diploma. Beyond that, I have a highly eclectic self-education. I claim no expertise or authority on any subject. I simply ask you to consider this. Much of the information I carry in my head was gathered in the pre-internet era, when I had to ride my bicycle to the public library and spend weeks at a time reading information from tunes made of pigments printed upon pages of compressed sawdust. As a result, I cannot provide a list of resources for most of the information I gathered decades past. So please keep in mind that much of this relies on my highly fallible memory, and as such perhaps should be considered at least equal parts legend and history. And for our Easter service, today's reading comes from the lesser-known Gospel of Keith. And upon the holy day of his resurrection, Jesus surprised the apostles with woven baskets filled with brightly colored eggs and confectionaries, as baby rabbits danced about his feet. So much to unpack about this holiday, but I want to eventually explain why hunting for Easter eggs should not be an activity for children, at least not if people were aware of its meanings and origins. Early Christian leaders decided it would be easiest to overlay major holidays onto the days the popular pagan religions of the time were already celebrating. Hence, Christmas was overlaid onto Yule, a.k.a. the winter solstice, and Easter was overlaid onto the festival of Estera, a popular pagan fertility goddess of the time. Spring, of course, being the time when the snow and ice subsided, and the fields and forests renewed and became fertile for growing crops and hunting. This is why the rabbit is associated with Easter, because as soon as you start seeing any significant amount of green grass, you start seeing baby rabbits. Seeing as the festival of Ostera was about the earth being reborn after having laid dormant for months under the snow and ice, Christians decided to tell people this was actually about Jesus Christ having been crucified and rising from the grave. Personally, I think it would have made more sense if they had swapped Christmas and Easter. The Bible does describe Jesus as being born in the early spring, so why not have him being born just after the vernal equinox? It would also seem more fitting for him to die at Yule, the darkest time of the year, and to be reborn to correspond with the beginning of the new year. Alas, I was not consulted on the matter at the time, so let's work with it the way they set it up. To most people, the biggest mystery of this holiday is trying to figure out what date Easter will fall on each year. About the only thing most people know for certain is that Easter always falls on a Sunday. It isn't as simple as just being the second Sunday in April. In fact, while it usually occurs in April, in some years it falls in the end of March, and on rare occasion it can even be the first Sunday in May. So how is the date determined each year? Well, there is a formula. Easter is always on the first Sunday, which follows the full moon, which occurs immediately after the vernal equinox. Unless the full moon happens to fall on Sunday, in which case Easter will be the following Sunday. I swear I am not making this up. This is the actual criteria that the Vatican uses to determine what day Easter will fall on each year. That's a fair calculation to unravel, so let's take this step by step. The vernal equinox, or spring equinox, is the day on which the day and the night are the same length, equinox meaning equal. So with a 24-hour rotation of the Earth, this theoretically means 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. Of course, the length of day and night will vary with how far north or south you are from the equator. So this refers to when the day and night are of equal lengths at the Earth's equator. This happens each year around March 20th, give or take a day. So this is when the celebration of Astera was held, because this is when the land becomes noticeably fertile, and hence signaled early agricultural societies that this was time to start planting their crops. Well, almost. We have to get back to the fact that for thousands of years, people used lunar calendars instead of a solar calendar. So the full moon marked the end of the month. So the festival of Ostera was celebrated on the first full moon, which followed the vernal equinox. I'm not quite sure why they didn't go with something simple, like making 
Easter, the first Sunday that followed the equinox. But again, calendars have been switched several times in between, and this has really gotten confused in the process. So back to the early Christian leaders trying to correspond Easter with the Feast of Ostera. So after the vernal equinox, they needed to wait for the full moon, which could take place anywhere from the following day for up to 28 days later. Then, of course, Easter had to be on a Sunday, because that's the most holy day to the Christians. So then they need to wait another one to seven days until it was Sunday. This basically meant Easter could potentially fall on any date from March 20th through April 26th. However, if it happens that the Sunday in April is the night of the full moon, then Easter must be pushed back an additional week to the first Sunday in May. Wait, why? What's wrong with having Easter be on the day when there's the full moon at the ne that night? Well, basically, because the church wanted to overlay the Christian holidays onto the pagan holidays, but they also need to make certain that people are celebrating their approved holiday and not the traditional pagan festival. So they had to make certain that Easter would never fall on the same night as the Festival of Ostera, even if this meant pushing it back into the following month. It should now be clear as mud to you how to figure out which date Easter will fall on each year. Just find out which day will be the vernal equinox, then consult a moon phase chart to determine when will be the first full moon after that date, then check your calendar to determine when the next Sunday will fall after that date will be, and cross-reference with the moon chart to make sure that that's not the night of the full moon, because if it is, then you need to go to the following Sunday. See how simple that all is? Now that we've covered how to figure out which day Easter is, and why it's associated with rabbits, I think we can finally get to the topic of the colored eggs. If you need someone to explain to you why eggs are a fertility symbol, then you'd better enroll in some kind of remedial sex ed course. I'm going to assume everybody can figure that out, and I'm skipping ahead to why the eggs are colored, or at least originally why they were each decorated with unique marks on each egg. Okay, just in case someone's lost track here, let's remember that the Festival of Osteria is all about fertility. Fertility not only applies to growing plants and animals reproducing, but it also applies to humans having children. Some pagan cultures in the British Isles in Northern Europe had a tradition that when the sun went down on the eve of the full moon for the Festival of Ostera, each of the young maids in the village would paint an egg with a unique mark or pattern so that each one could be identified as to which maiden it belonged to. With all the young men inside their huts, the maidens would each hide their eggs. After they had all hidden their eggs and gathered at a bonfire, a signal would be sounded, usually a horn, and the young men would come out of the huts to search for the eggs. Each young man, upon finding an egg, would go to the bonfire to find out which maiden's egg it was he had found. That maiden would then be his until the following sunrise. Can you see now why this is rather creepy as a kid's game? The prize for finding an egg was having a random teenage girl sleep with you, pretty much regardless of whether she liked it or not. The girls really didn't have a whole lot of choice in the entire affair. If you're participating in a celebration in honor of a deity, you pretty much have to go along with it. Remember, these people had been indoctrinated since birth into the religion, so questioning the existence of the deity likely never occurred to anyone. You were engaged in a celebration designed to honor this deity, so going against the accepted tradition would be breaking the rules, and that was likely to piss off said deity. Who you ended up spending the night with was regarded as being the will of the gods. Would you be willing to risk the consequences of offending a god? Highly unlikely, even if this meant you had to have sex with someone you found repulsive. But since Christians stripped the holiday of its original meaning, what was originally a random pairing up of teenagers is now considered a game for any child old enough to walk. Thank you for watching. I'd very much appreciate it if you click the like and subscribe to my channel. And again, in closing, I claim no expertise or authority on any subject. If you question what I said here, I regard that as a step in the right direction, because my goal is to get you to think for yourself.